Hey Joanne, is it true that our neighbor's son John got first rank? Yes, Jim. Look at the newspaper. Even his photo got published. Wow! I saw a lot of visitors arriving at his home and congratulating him for his great achievement. Well, it's not a surprise, you know. Huh? Why? Both his parents are doctors. They were training him for a long time for this entrance exam. Oh, then there is no surprise as you said. Hmm, but why do the parents want their children to follow them? Some parents are like that, Jim. But we should be thanking God that our parents are not like that. Yeah, we should. Can I ask you something? What is it? See, we have been listening to the stories of saints. Is there any saint whose parents were also a saint? Mm, do you remember the story of Augustine of Hippo? His mother, Monica, was also a saint. That's right. Do you know of anyone else? Oh, no. I have no idea about that, Jim. We will ask Uncle Francis when he comes today. Good morning, children. Good morning, Uncle Francis. Now, whose story do you want to hear today? Uncle, was there any other saint whose parents were also declared saints? Well, there was St. Augustine of Hippo. I told him that. But is there anyone else like that, Uncle Francis? Of course, Jim. Hmm. Parents of Mother Mary. Joachim and Anna were also saints. Anyone else, Uncle Francis? Yes, the parents of St. Teresa of Lisieux, popularly known as the Little Flower, are also saints. St. Teresa of Lisieux? Can you narrate her story today, Uncle? All right. Now listen carefully. Teresa was born in France in 1873, the pampered daughter of a mother who wanted to be a saint and a father who had wanted to be a monk. The two had gotten married, but determined they would be celibate until a priest told them that was not how God wanted a marriage to work. They must have followed his advice very well because they had nine children. The five children who survived were all daughters. Zeli, what should I do? This deadly disease has claimed the life of four of our children. Hmm. Let the nurse Rose look after her. She took good care of Leonie and Celine. When they were kids. But Rose has her own children to be looked after. How will she stay away from her kids? Dear, let us send Teresa to her home. I'm sure she'll take good care of her. Hmm. I agree with you. She has always been such a great nurse. Teresa was handed over to the care of Rose Taye, and for 15 months she was taken care of by this nurse. But in the meantime, her mother was desperately fighting the cancer. Louise, my daughters, I think, I think that my time on earth is about to come to an end. Mother, what are you saying? Teresa, mom is sick and she's dying. What? But, but... Pauline? Yes, mother? You should take good care of Teresa. She's still a child. I'm sure Leonie and Celine can manage themselves. Teresa's 16-year-old sister, Pauline, now became her second mother. Pauline took good care of Teresa and both of them became quite inseparable. Sister, please don't leave. Mm. Don't cry, Teresa. God will look after you. I will miss you. I will miss you too, dear. Don't forget to pray every day. In a few months, Teresa got ill and she was bedridden. She's going to die, you know. Oh, shut up. How can you speak like that in front of a little girl? Hmm. Hmm. Where? Where is Mary? Oh, she's there praying to Mother Mary. My dear, listen to me. You should start praying to Mother Mary and all your troubles will go away. Is it true? Of course it is. I know so many people who got cured after they prayed to Mother Mary. Teresa saw her sisters praying to Mother Mary. She too started praying to Our Lady. The, the little girl, girl, as usual, was praying, praying to Mother, Mother Mary, Mary that night. night. Oh, Mother. 
Mother Mary, please heal me. It was then that she saw Mother Mary smiling in front of her. Huh? Am I dreaming? As soon as the vision disappeared, Teresa was able to sit upright, and she was completely healed. Father! Father! What? What happened? Look, Father! I'm all right now! Huh? It's true? You're healed? <laughs> How did this happen? I was praying to Mother Mary, and it was she who healed me. <laughs> You're so innocent! It's true, Father. She just appeared before me, and she smiled at me. What? Are you... are you sure? Yes, Father. Huh. <sighs> Thank you, God. Teresa was the pampered little girl in their household, and she always started crying for even simple reasons. Teresa, come on. Why are you sitting alone and crying? Miss, my classmates keep making fun of me. Oh, that's part of school life, dear. You should take things in the right spirit. How else are you going to enjoy your school life? I'm coming here only because my sisters are in school. Teresa had all the tantrums of a young girl. She always had an outburst of emotions, and that made her different from other children. After a few years, her sisters, Marie and Leone, also joined the convent. This made little Teresa also think about joining the convent. But she knew that she wouldn't be able to handle the rigors of the Carmelite life as long as she couldn't handle her own emotional outbursts. Uncle Francis, how did she overcome this weakness? She describes that in her Story of a Soul about this great conversion on a Christmas day. Uncle Francis, is that book her autobiography? Yes, it is in fact a collection of the letters she had written and published by her elder sister, Sister Pauline. It was a custom in France to place the Christmas gift for the children inside their shoes on the eve of Christmas Day. Celine, have you not stopped this practice? Teresa is no longer a baby. Speak softly, Father. Teresa might hear us. You know she gets upset easily. But Celine, this pampering need to stop. I know that she wants to join the convent. How is she going to survive the strict rules of the convent? if she's pampered like this. Meanwhile, Teresa was listening to the entire conversation. On a normal occasion, she would have been shattered. But God was slowly transforming her for a noble cause. Jesus arrived into her heart and did what Teresa could not. When Celine realized that Teresa had heard what they said, she thought Teresa would be in tears in a few seconds. Oh, Teresa, were you listening to our conversation? Yes, Celine. Huh? Are you not upset at what Dad said? No, not at all. I think God is working His ways so that I can join the convent. When Teresa's father approached the church authorities to allow her into the Carmelite, they initially refused. They said that she was too young to enter the convent. However, Teresa's mind was made up. She couldn't bear to wait as she felt that God was calling her to enter a nun's life. She was so determined that she traveled to the Vatican to meet the Pope personally. The Pope was slightly taken aback to hear such an unusual request from a young girl. Well, my child, do what the superiors decide. In a few days, Teresa got the required permissions to join the Carmelite convent. Convent life was not without hardships. It was cold and the accommodations were basic. And it was nothing like Teresa had imagined before. Jesus? I finally joined the convent. Thank you for helping me. Her father suffered a series of strokes that left him affected not only physically but mentally. When he began hallucinating and grabbed for a gun as if going into battle, he was taken to an asylum for the insane. Horrified, Teresa learned of the humiliation of the father she adored and admired and of the gossip and pity of their so-called friends. As a cloistered nun, she couldn't even visit her father. Teresa realized that she would never be able to attain sainthood unless there was a miracle. So she decided to do little deeds to make others happy around her. She took every chance to sacrifice, no matter how small it would seem. She smiled at the sisters she didn't like. She ate everything that was given without complaining, so that she was often given the worst leftovers.
Oh no! Can't you be a little more careful, Teresa? Do you know how expensive that vase was? Mother, please forgive me. I will not repeat this. Hey, Teresa, why did you take the blame for my mistake? Don't worry, sister, that's all right. Teresa had poor health and she was often bedridden. But she conversed with Jesus continuously, and in spite of her ill health, she wanted to attain sainthood by doing little things. She took her vows on 8th of September, 1890, and took the name as Teresa of Child Jesus. She wrote many letters to express her devotion to the Holy Face. One day, Teresa was called into the office of her sister Pauline. Did you call me, sister? Teresa, come, sit down. Hmm, I think I may have some bad news for you. Huh? What is it? I think I have been selected as the new prioress. Wow, that's such a wonderful news. But why are you looking so sad, sister? I'm coming to that. Don't worry. Tell me, what is it? Mm. Look, Teresa. Now that I have been elected as the prioress, everyone in the convent feels that we sisters will take over the convent. They think that we will push everyone to get what we want. I don't blame them as there are four of us here in the convent now and the convent strength is only about 20. Hmm, that's true. I can understand their concerns. Now listen, Teresa. What I'm going to tell you now might hurt a bit, but it's only for the greater good. You will have to remain a novice. <laughs> that's all? Don't you realize how serious this is? This means that you will never be a fully professed nun and you would always have to ask permission for everything you do. Hmm, I understand, sister. Don't worry. Thank you, sister. You don't realize how great your sacrifice is. Thank you. Teresa didn't worry at all about spending her remaining life as a novice at the convent. All she wanted to do was little deeds that would make others happy. After a few years, one day while she was working, she started coughing up blood. <coughs> but she kept working and never told anyone about her sickness. It took almost a year for everyone to realize that Teresa was sick. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't want you to leave your duties. I'm sorry, Teresa. I should have never asked for all those sacrifices from you. That's all right, sister. Teresa, I want you to write your memos on a book for me. Can you do that? Memos? But who's going to read that? You don't worry about that. Just do like I told you. With your life, I want to show to the world that performing your duties with great love is much more important to God. All right, sister. And as her sister told her, she started writing letters documenting her thoughts and encouraging others to pray to God. Uncle Francis, it is really surprising that Teresa of Child Jesus did not do any extraordinary deeds, but she was still made the patron saint. You are absolutely right, Joan. She had not traveled anywhere from the convent to spread the good news, nor did she perform any miracles. But then... How was she made the patron saint of missions? Teresa had assisted the Society of Foreign Missions in the role of a spiritual sister. She had written letters to them encouraging, consoling, and praying for their missions through her little ways. Uncle Francis, what was the cause for her early death? On the eve of Good Friday in 1896, after the prayers she went to bed, she was suffering from tuberculosis, which was not curable during those times. <sighs> oh, most loving Jesus, I know that my time on earth has come to an end. Teresa died on the 30th of September, 1897, and her last words were, My God, I love you. One nun commented that there was nothing to say about Teresa, but Pauline put together Teresa's writings and heavily edited them, unfortunately, and sent 2,000 copies to other convents. 
But Teresa's little way of trusting in Jesus to make her holy and relying on small daily sacrifices instead of great deeds appealed to the thousands of Catholics and others who were trying to find holiness in ordinary lives. Uncle Francis, how old was she when she died? She died at a very young age of 24. But uncle, when were the parents of Saint Teresa declared saints? They were canonized together on 18th October 2015. So truly, the family of Saint Teresa of Lisieux is a family of saints. Yes, Teresa of Lisieux is one of the patron saints of the missions. Not because she ever went anywhere, but because of her special love of the missions and the prayers and letters she gave in support of missionaries. This is a reminder to all of us who feel we can do nothing, that it is the little things that keep God's kingdom growing. That was such a wonderful story. I'm glad you liked it, Jim. That's all for today. I will tell you another story tomorrow. Goodbye, Uncle. Goodbye, kids. Jim, it's going to be a very good birdhouse. Now what color do you want to paint our birdhouse? Mm, how about white? Then the birds can see during the night too. Okay, that's a good idea Jim. Come on, let's start painting. I hope the parrots, sparrows and the other birds come to live here too. Wow, that was a good thought Jim. You know I like birds so much. It will be great to see all the birds flying around in our garden. <laughs> well, I was thinking how this world would have looked like if there were no animals and birds. Mm, that would have been very boring. Hey Jim, did you know that there is a patron saint for animals and nature? Huh, patron saint for animals and birds? Who is it, Joanne? It's St. Francis of Assisi. He is considered as the patron saint for birds and animals. Wow, Joanne, I have an idea. Let's ask Uncle Francis to tell us the story of St. Francis today. That's a great idea, Jim. Good morning, Uncle Francis. Good morning, children. What were you doing this morning? Uncle, we are making a bird house. And we planted a tree in our garden. Great job, children. I was thinking of telling you the story of the patron saint of birds and animals. Do you know who he is? <laughs> what a coincidence. Joanne told me about the patron saint. Isn't it Francis of Assisi? Wow, that's great, Joan. Yes, Uncle Francis. We were discussing about Saint Francis of Assisi while we were making the birdhouse. Very good, Joan. Then let me tell you the story of this great saint. A long, long time ago, in a little city known as Assisi in Italy, there lived a young boy named Francis Bernadone. Francis lived with his father and mother who loved him very much. Francis's father was one of the richest men in Assisi, and he made sure that Francis got everything he needed. He used to tell great tales of brave warriors every day. Francis loved these stories, and as he listened to his father, he longed to become a great knight someday. Francis grew up, and he made friends with the sons of the richest men in Assisi. Everybody liked Francis as he could sing, dance, and above all, he used to spend plenty of money at parties. Ha <laughs> ha! That was great fun today, my friends. Yes, my friend. 
We'll meet tomorrow as well. Good night, everyone. Oh no, it's so late. Mother would be waiting for me. I must reach home quickly. Huh? My son, stop, please. Huh? Who was that? My son, I haven't eaten anything all day. Can you please give me some money to buy food? What? Do you know who I am? I'm the son of the richest man in Assisi. How dare you stop me like this? I, I'm so sorry. I didn't know who you were. I, I was hungry. Sorry, please forgive me. Stupid old fool. Huh? No, I shouldn't have talked to him like that. Hello, stop. Please wait. What happened, son? Huh? Huh? I'm sorry for what I said. I shouldn't have spoken to you like that. That's all right, son. I hear that every time. Here, please take this. I don't want you to sleep on an empty stomach tonight. Huh? Thank you, my son. You are so kind. You should get something to eat. I have to leave now. The people who were close to Francis knew that, however careless he was, he always had a kind heart. In a few years, the war broke out, and Francis soon had a chance to be a soldier and fight the war. Please, my son, please don't leave. You know how much we love you. You don't have to do this, my son. Father, you know that I have always longed to become a knight. But, but I have always wanted you to be a merchant. Everything I have earned is for you. I know, father. But please let me do what I want. I love being a soldier. Hmm. All right, my son. If that's what you wish. Thank you, father. Thank you so much. Come back soon, my love. And so, at the age of 19, Francis joined the army and went to war against the nearby town of Perugia. The war lasted for many days, and Francis fought bravely. But the side that Francis fought for started losing, and eventually he was surrounded by the enemies. Everyone is dead. What am I supposed to do now? Kill him! <laughs> he is all alone. Let's finish him. No, let us not kill him. Let's take him as a prisoner and ask for ransom. Hmm, that's a good idea. This one looks rich. We can get good money from his parents. Francis was taken as a prisoner knowing that they will get a good amount of money as ransom from his father. Francis was put in a dungeon, and he was to wait there till his father paid the ransom. But it took almost a year of negotiations before Francis could be released. In the meantime, he fell sick with high fever. It was then that he started receiving visions from God. <sighs> Oh, Lord. Huh? 
Was it real? Or am I just dreaming? The visions he received made Francis a reformed person. Francis returned home after a few days, but he kept receiving these visions from God. He now wore ordinary clothes, and he stayed away from lavish parties and friends. Instead of his love for leading a soldier's life, a new love was born in his heart, a love for all the hungry and sick people in the world. Hello, brother. How are you feeling? Huh? Are you not Francis, son of Pietro the silk merchant? Yes, I am, sir. I was born as a privileged person, but now I see Jesus in you. Oh, what a surprise! Strange are the ways of the Lord. Okay, brother. I will come and meet the other people staying in your colony. I hope I can be of service to you. It seemed to him that he must go everywhere and tell everyone to love one another. Francis spent most of his time praying in mountain hideaways and in the churches nearby. One day, he received another vision from God. <sighs> Lord, if that's your will, not fully understanding the word of the Lord, Francis thought that his mission was to repair the churches which were in poor condition. So he sold his clothes and his father's horse to collect money for repairing the church. This really angered his father, and he took him to the Bishop of Assisi. Your Excellency, I think my son has turned insane. Huh? What makes you think like that, Pietro? He has sold all of my silk clothes and even my horse for the sake of repairing some churches. Is this allegation true, Francis? Your Excellency, I have been entrusted with a mission by the Lord to rebuild the churches. But my son, we are here to do that. Why do you want to spend your father's money for that? But Your Excellency, who gave my father this wealth? God has given and I have taken for the sake of God. See, didn't I tell you that he has turned mad? Young gentleman, what you're saying may be correct, but you need to return the money to your father as you have done this without his permission. All right, Your Excellency. If you say so, I'm willing to give back his money. I will also return the clothes I wear, which was also bought with my father's money. Christian Family TV is made possible by your generosity. Because of your donation today, we were able to create more than 200 plus wonderful stories on saints, stories of faith, and many other interesting videos to teach our kids. Yes, you are making a difference. We could not do what we do without you. We want to remind you again to take a Patreon subscription. It only costs $2 to start with, or make a one-time donation starting at $5. This will help us continue making these videos. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He smile on you and be gracious to you. Thank you, and God bless you. a book. I know that. What are you reading about? It's about Saint Philomena. Saint Philomena? Who was she? I don't know yet, Jim. I have just started reading this book. Don't be like that. Tell me something about this saint, please. I'm telling you the truth. Look at this book. The language they have used in this book is so tough. I'm not able to understand it at all. I have an idea. Ha ha ha! I know what you're thinking. 
Let's ask Uncle Francis. And Uncle Francis is here. <laughs> Good morning, Uncle. Good morning, children. I know that look on your faces. You want a story, right? Haha, <laughs> that's right, Uncle. Can you tell us the story of Saint Philomena today? Yes, Uncle. I brought this book about the saint from the library. But the language is so tough, and I don't understand it at all. Saint Philomena, right? All right. Now why don't we go for a walk, and I'll tell you her story. That's a great idea. Let me put on my shoes. Come on, let's go. Yes, Uncle. Little is known about the life of Saint Philomena. In 1802, the remains of a young woman were found in a catacomb of Saint Priscilla on the Via Solaria. It was covered with stones, the symbols on which indicated that the body was a martyr named Saint Philomena. She is the only saint to have revealed her story in what you can call private revelation. Huh? What does that mean? Saint Philomena revealed her story to three different people in different parts of the world. These three people didn't know each other as well. Was all their three stories the same, uncle? Yes, it was. Now what I'm going to tell you is what was revealed to Mother Maria Luisa de Jesu. Philomena is believed to have been born in Corfu, a small island in ancient Greece, towards the end of the 3rd century. Her father was a king who controlled a small state in Greece, and her mother was also from royal blood. In those times, idol worship was a common practice, and the king and queen were no different as well. They had been without children for a long, long time. They offered sacrifices and prayers to their false gods so that they could have a child. God, please help us with a child. Please, God, we have been offering you sacrifices for many years now. Please. Please let us have a child. But all their sacrifices were in vain, and they didn't have a child for a long, long time. There lived a doctor named Publius, who lived in the palace servicing the king. The doctor was a preacher of Christianity as well. He understood the pain of the king, so one day he came to them and talked to them about Jesus. He promised to pray for them if they agreed to receive baptism. What do you think, dear? His word sounds true. I think we had been praying to false gods all this time. Otherwise, why wouldn't they bless us with a child? Hmm, that's true, my queen. We made so many sacrifices, and yet we don't have a child. The words of the doctor had enlightened their spirits. They got baptized and got converted into Christianity. And in a few months, they were blessed with a beautiful daughter. We are going to call you Philomena, which means the daughter of light. <laughs> That's such a lovely name. We love you, Philomena. The king and queen were finally rewarded with what they longed for. They were very happy now. Philomena grew up to be a beautiful child. She was very well behaved and she was a faithful follower of Lord Jesus Christ. When she was a child, she had offered herself to Jesus and she took a vow to offer her virginity to Jesus Christ alone. Their happiness didn't last for long. After a few years, by the time Philomena had turned 13, the Roman Emperor Diocletian threatened to attack the island. The king 
king and his family were called to Rome to discuss peace between the states. That emperor is an evil man. Do you think he will agree for peace? I don't know, dear, but we have to give it a try. Don't worry, father. God is with us. Hmm. Yes, dear. God will help us. When they arrived at the capital, they proceeded to the palace to meet the king. As soon as the emperor saw Philomena, his eyes were fixed on her. He was possessed by her beauty and grace. The king pleaded his defense sincerely, and he begged for peace. He didn't want his people to bear the suffering of war, so he earnestly pleaded with the emperor. But all this time, the emperor did not take his eyes off Philomena. As soon as the king stopped, the emperor spoke to him. Thank you for coming to Rome. Don't worry about the war. There will be no war if you give me what I ask for. What do you ask for, emperor? You shall have all the force of my empire and think of living happily for the rest of your lives. I ask only one thing, and that is the hand of your daughter. Huh? The king was surprised to hear the offer, which was far from what he was expecting. He didn't think twice and agreed to the offer. What? That is such a wonderful offer, Emperor. Of course. Of course you can marry my daughter. But, but father... Shh, be silent. We will talk about this once we reach back home. Now, you may go back to your island and make preparations for the wedding. Thank you, my lord. Once they reached back home, the king and the queen did everything they could to convince Philomena. No! How could you? I have offered myself to Jesus. Please don't make me do this. But that was a long time ago. And you were just a child then. You were of no such age to make that engagement. They fought about this for days and nights. The king and the queen caressed her, threatened her, and did everything they could to convince their daughter. But Philomena stood strong. At last, they fell on their knees and started begging her. My child, have pity on us, our country, our subjects, please. No, nothing comes before to me than Lord Jesus. Not you, not my country. Not even my subjects. The king was in a state of despair now. He finally decided to take her to the emperor without seeking her permission. I hope she'll be all right. My lovely lady. Why are you denying this marriage? I can give anything you ask for. Gold, servants, palaces, whatever you ask for. I am the emperor and I can grant you anything. Nothing that you give will satisfy me. I have pledged myself to Lord Jesus and I will never marry anyone else. <laughs> you are so naive. Don't you realize that you are talking to the most powerful man on earth? Not even your Jesus can save you if I decide so. You are mistaken, my lord. You are nothing before Lord Jesus. How dare you? Soldiers, arrest her and put her in prison. The emperor was very angry with Philomena and he ordered her to be chained and put in prison. He thought that the pain and shame would weaken the courage of Philomena.
After a few days, the emperor came to visit her and see if she was willing to marry him. What do you say now? Are you going to marry me? I cannot marry you, for I have promised myself for the Lord. <sighs> you are going to rot in this cell. The emperor put her in captivity and tortured her for 37 days. And on the night of the 37th day of her captivity, Mother Mary appeared before her. Huh? Oh, blessed mother! My daughter, three more days of prison, and after 40 days you will receive heavenly glory. Thank you! Thank you, mother! Have courage, my child. You will have to face severe hardship in the coming days. But fear not, for your angel Gabriel will come to your aid. And then the vision disappeared. These words of Mother Mary gave her strength again, and the cell was filled with celestial aroma. Huh? What's that lovely perfume? <laughs> oh, it's amazing. It's coming from the inside. Look! It, it feels so divine. That's true. When the Emperor learned that she wasn't giving up, he got really angry. Strip her! Strip her and lash her in full view of the man here! The soldiers who were guarding her cell brought her and tied her to a pole. They hesitated to unclothe her completely as they felt some sort of divinity in her. But they were forced to obey the Emperor, so they started lashing her. The soldiers kept lashing Philomena until she was covered in blood. That's enough! She's going to die any moment now. Take her back to the dungeon and let her die in there. The soldiers dragged her body back into the cell, expecting her to die soon. That's when two angels descended from heaven, appearing to her in the darkness. They poured soothing balm into her wounds, and Philomena was even better than before. Hey, look! What happened? Is she dead? Take a look and see for yourself. God, that's a miracle. Thank God who saved her. What she is saying must be the truth. Jesus must be the real God. Hmm. But we must inform this to the king. <laughs> he is going to be really angry when he sees her. When the emperor heard what had happened, he was furious. Huh? How could that happen? I saw blood with my own eyes. She must have died now. Tie an anchor around her neck and throw her in the river. Let her die in full view of the public. The next day, a heavy anchor was tied around Philomena's neck. And she was about to be thrown into the river. Many people had gathered there to witness the punishment. Throw the anchor! I... I am sorry for doing this. Don't worry. The angels will guard me. The soldiers threw the heavy anchor into the river. And it dragged Philomena into the river as well. As soon as she hit the riverbed, the angels appeared and loosened the chains around Philomena's neck. She was then raised from underwater in full view of the public to the riverbank. She was unharmed and she was not even wet. <laughs> 
The crowds cheered for her, and some of them embraced Lord Jesus when they watched this miracle. I can't believe my eyes. Her God must be the true God. I am going to be a Christian from today. What sort of sorcery is this? I shouldn't let her live any longer. Then the emperor ordered her to be dragged along the streets. Then he commanded the archers to shoot her with arrows. Fire! all over her body. She was covered in blood. The soldiers dragged her body back into the dungeon and locked her in. Do you think she will die this time? I... I hope not. I hope her God saves her this time too. And yes, they did. The angels appeared again and healed her in no time. That night, Philomena went into a sweet, deep sleep. When the emperor heard what happened, he ordered the soldiers to fire arrows at her again. And this time, he wanted her to die in full view of the public. Philomena was made to stand on the street and the archers got ready to shoot arrows at her. But this time, none of the arrows hit her. The emperor tried again and again, but the arrows simply refused to hit her. You are a magician? Now watch what's going to happen to you. The emperor thought he could defeat magic by using burning arrows. Fire! But this time, before the burning arrows could hit her, they took a U-turn and hit the archers instead. <laughs> ah! Ah! Now all the archers were dead. The people among the crowd realized the divinity of Philomena and bowed down before her. I bow down to your gods. They are truly powerful. We are convinced of your faith. These murmurs and acclamations infuriated the emperor. That's enough. Let's not play with her anymore. Chop our head off now. Philomena was truly relieved when she heard this. She knew that today she was going to die and enter heaven. She had longed for so long for this day. Philomena died on a Friday, the third hour after midday, the same hour and day as Jesus had died. And that's the story of St. Philomena. Wow, that was such a great story, Uncle. I'm glad you liked it, dear. She died at the young age of 13. So she is considered a patron saint for babies, infants, and youth. After hundreds of miraculous cures through her intercession, she was beatified in 1837. Come on, kids, it's getting very late. We must head back now. Yes, Uncle. How was your day, Jim? It was good, Uncle. We won the football match today. Wow, that's excellent, Jim. And I scored full marks in the history test. You are always amazing, Joan. Thank you, Uncle. Now, shall I tell you the story of a saint today? We are ready. Haha, <laughs> alright. 
I'm going to tell you the story of Saint Benedict today. Now listen carefully. Benedict was born in a small, remote village in Italy named Norcia in 480 AD. He was born in a wealthy family, and he had a twin sister named Scholastica. My son, I'm going to name you Benedict, which means the Blessed One. That's an excellent name, my dear. And what do you want to name our daughter? How about Scholastica? That's a wonderful name. Benedict attended his primary school in Norcia along with his sister. It was a common practice among the wealthy families to send their sons to Rome for advanced studies. By the time Benedict reached the age of 20, his family decided to send him to Rome as well. We are going to miss you, my son. Don't worry, father. I'll be all right. Take care of your health. And don't forget to send letters. <laughs> don't worry, mother. I will. Goodbye, Benedict. Goodbye, Scholastica. Let's start, master. Benedict was also accompanied by his old nurse, who was entrusted with the responsibility of taking care of him. Benedict started his classes at a prestigious university in Rome, and he began to broaden his knowledge by studying the great works of humanity. He studied philosophy, history, and literature. He believed that education would lead his mind and body to God. Who's there? Hey there! Hello, why are you here at this time of the night? Hey Benedict, do you want to come with us to a party? What? No, I have much to study. Look at you. You should be enjoying your life, my friend. Come with us. Yes, come with us. There will be many girls there. It's going to be fun. No, I'd rather stay here and study. What are you doing there? Aren't you coming to the party? Oh, it's already late. Come, let's go. You were such a fool to waste your time. <laughs> Benedict was sad to see that his friends were leading a wayward life. Wine, loose women, and prude behavior were all they were interested in. God, please help me. Give me strength to never go astray. Give me the money. No. I said leave the bag. Please, that's all I have. You stupid old fool. How dare you? Ah! Hey, stop. Huh? Stop, you thief. Help. Help me. Huh? Hey, sir. Please help me. Don't worry, sir. It's going to be all right. Thank you, son. You are so kind. Benedict was unhappy with what was going on around him. He did not want to make the same mistakes that everyone did. He then arrived at a decision. The next day, Benedict quit his studies and packed his bags to leave the city. He took his old nurse with him and headed for the mountains. According to Pope Gregory's account, giving over his books and forsaking his father's house and wealth, Where are we going, Master? I don't know. All I know is that I have to get away from the city. Rejecting all the corrupt and depraved environment of the city, Benedict went to Afil, a small village near the mountains east of Rome. Benedict reached the Church of St. Peter, and he then explained the reasons for leaving the city to the priests there. And, and that's why I left the city. I could not live there any longer. Hmm, we understand your concerns. 
You are welcome to stay here as long as you like. Thank you. Thank you so much. Benedict then lived in the company of virtuous men who were sympathetic to his feelings. One day, he was as usual speaking to the monks. He who labors as he prays lifts his heart to God with his hands. Huh? What happened? I'm sorry, master. I just broke the wheat sifter. Oh, don't worry. It's all right. Benedict worked his first miracle that day. He magically restored the broken wheat sifter by just waving his hands. <laughs> The news of the miracle spread fast, and soon many people came to see Benedict. This made Benedict even more frustrated, so he left the church and decided to live on the slopes of a mountain away from everyone. Benedict then lived the life of a hermit, praying to God most of the time. One day, when he came to the river nearby, some shepherds caught sight of him. Hey, look! Huh? What is it? Look near that river. Can you see anything? Huh? Is that... is that an animal? I think so. Come, let's go and take a closer look. Let's go! The shepherds mistook Benedict for an animal, as he was all dressed up in animal skins. What? It's a man! Huh? Hey, you! Huh? Who are you? And what are you doing in the mountains? Hello, my name is Benedict. Benedict then explained why he was living in the mountains to them. When the shepherds realized that he was a servant of God, they started respecting him. They visited him often, bringing their friends and family along to hear him speak. All of them were quite moved with the words of Benedict, and many of them converted to Christianity. One day, it so happened that a priest was preparing his dinner on an Easter Sunday when he suddenly heard a divine voice. You are preparing yourself a banquet while my servant Benedict at Sublacum is dressed with hunger. Huh? Was that? Was that a vision? The kind priest immediately set off searching for Benedict. Hello, is anyone here? The priest searched for Benedict everywhere. He searched near the river, in the nearby villages. And finally, the priest found Benedict outside his cave. Benedict was surprised to see a man come searching for him. Before they entered a conversation, Benedict requested him to join him in his prayer. And after praying together, they chatted for some time, and Benedict ate the food that the priest brought for him. From that day, many others climbed their way up the steep cliff. They carried small offerings of food with them when they came to visit Benedict. Saint Benedict had to struggle with temptations of the flesh and the devil. One of these struggles is described by Saint Gregory. On a certain day when he was alone, the tempter presented himself. A small dark bird, commonly called a blackbird, 
began to fly around his face and came so near to him that if he had wished, he could have seized it with his hand. Benedict realized that this was the devil in disguised form. Ugh, ugh. But on making the sign of the cross, the bird flew away. Then followed a violent temptation of the flesh such as he had never before experienced. The evil spirit brought before his imagination a woman whom he had formerly seen and inflamed his heart with such vehement desire at the memory of her that he had very great difficulty in repressing it. The memory was so strong that he even thought of leaving the solitude. Ugh. Hmm. Suddenly, with the help of divine grace, he found the strength he needed. When he looked around, he saw a thick growth of briars and nettles. He stripped off his habit and jumped himself into the midst of them. He plunged and tossed around the thorns, badly tearing his skin. His whole body was wounded and blood was dripping all over. Ah! Oh, ah! Oh, ah! Oh. Through those bodily wounds, he cured the wounds of his soul. Benedict had won over the temptations, and never again was he disturbed by the devil. Benedict matured both in mind and character by living the life of a hermit. His life of discipline and solitude also won him respect among the local Christians. One day, a few monks from the nearby monastery came to visit him. The abbot of the monastery had died recently, and they were here to invite him to be their new abbot. Good morning, master. Good morning, son. Why are you here? Master, you must have heard about the death of our abbot Vikovaro. Hmm, yes, I did. He was such a good man. Master, we came here to ask if you would be willing to become our new abbot. Yes, master. It would be our pleasure to serve under you. But Benedict knew too well about the lack of discipline in the monastery. No, I can't do that. But master, we could learn from you so much. Look, my son, I'm happy that you considered me. But I, I just can't accept the post. My way of life and yours is completely different. There is no way that we can get along together. Master, you don't have to worry about that. We are willing to change our ways if you become our abbot. And after a lot of compulsion, Benedict finally agreed to accept the post. Benedict took charge as the abbot of the monastery and started imposing his strict discipline on the monks. Brothers, let us fast today. Let us not eat anything. Come with me to the prayer hall. How dare he! The monks soon got frustrated with the new rules of the monastery. I knew this was a bad idea from the beginning. Why did we have to bring that savage to the monastery? We had such a good life here. And now? ha! Ah, what does he think of himself? We must get rid of him quickly. Hey, I have an idea. What? What is it? The monks got tired of the strict rules of Benedict, so they decided to poison him. Please drink this, master. Thank you, brother. Benedict didn't realize that his drink was poisoned, so he took the glass and, as usual, closed his eyes for praying. Poisoned, wasn't it? We, we are sorry, Master. Why did you have to plot this wicked thing against me? Didn't I tell you before that my ways are not the same as yours? Now go and find another abort. After what you have done, I can no longer stay here. Benedict then returned to his cave and started living again in solitude. However, many people attracted by Benedict's sanctity and character 
came to Subiaco to seek his guidance and learn the true way of monastic life. Over the years, he started 12 monasteries in the valley. He appointed different superiors for each of his monasteries. He also constructed many schools for children. When Benedict started the 13th monastery, he started living there and took charge as the abbot of all 13 monasteries. Benedict's fame spread rapidly. People came all the way down from Rome to visit him. It was during this time that he was entrusted with the responsibility of taking care of Morris and Placidus, who later on became the two gems of Benedictine family. Once it so happened that there was a severe scarcity of water in the valley. The monks who lived in the monastery had no water to drink and do their chores. Benedict went searching for water, as he knew that God will always provide. Now climb that rock, and you will find water on the other side. Huh? Are you sure, Master? Do you doubt me? I'm sorry. I will go and see, Master. <sighs> Morris! Look! Huh? It's a miracle! It's a miracle! We have found water! <laughs> Benedict performed many other miracles during his time. One day, Placidus, who had gone near the lake, fell into the water and started drowning. Somebody help! Benedict, who was sleeping in his cell, was able to sense the danger. He ran to meet Morris and asked him to go and help Placidus. But Master, even if it's true, how will I save him? I don't know how to swim. Don't worry about that. You will be able to walk on water. Now hurry, go now. I'm going, Master. <laughs> I'm able to walk on water. It was another miracle. Morris walked on water and Placidus was saved that day. But not everyone was happy with what was going around. Some monks at the monastery were tired of the strict rules of Benedict and they tried to poison him again. This time, they poisoned his bread. This time, before he could even bite the bread, a bird flew in and snatched the bread away. Benedict performed many miracles in his lifetime, including raising a boy who was dead. It so happened that there was an accident while they were constructing a wall. A little boy was crushed to death during the accident. But Benedict raised him from the dead, healing his utterly destroyed body. The boy was completely healed, and he started helping at the site immediately. Totila, the king of Goths, had heard of Benedict and wished to meet him. But before seeing him in person, he wanted to test Benedict to see if he really had miraculous powers. One day, he asked his guard to dress in his usual attire and sent him with three escorts to visit Benedict. But Benedict was not fooled. My son, take off what you are wearing. It does not belong to you. Huh? But how did you know? The guard was dumbfounded by Benedict's wisdom and he hurried back to his king to report the news. Totella himself visited Benedict, and he was so inspired that he knelt before him in awe. Benedict warned Tortilla that he had done much evil, and he should change his ways to at least end his life in honor. He foretold that Totella would enter Rome, cross the sea, and would go on to reign for nine years, after which he will die. It happened exactly as Benedict had foretold. 
Totila did go to Rome and then later sailed to Sicily. In 10 years, he lost his crown, and like Benedict predicted, he died. Benedict spent the final years of his life seeking to realize the ideal of monasticism in a communal setting. In order to create unity and formalize the discipline, he drew up his famous rule. According to the tradition, St. Benedict died on March 21st, 547. He foresaw his coming death and he informed his close and faraway disciples that his death was near. Six days before dying, he had the grave which he was supposed to share with his deceased sister, St. Scholastica, opened. He asked the monks to take him to the oratory, where, after taking his last Holy Communion, he died supported by the monks. That was such an amazing story! Thanks for telling the story, Uncle. Hmm, I'm glad you liked it. Benedict is often depicted along with the symbols like blackbird, a rosebush, a dove, or a luminous stairway leading to heaven. He is also often depicted with King Tortilla at his feet. The Feast of St. Benedict is celebrated on March 21st. That's all for today. I will tell you the story of another saint tomorrow. Goodbye, children. Goodbye, Uncle. Christian Family TV is made possible by your generosity. Because of your donation today, we were able to create more than 200 plus wonderful stories on saints, stories of faith, and many other interesting videos to teach our kids. Yes, you are making a difference. We could not do what we do without you. We want to remind you again to take a Patreon subscription. It only costs $2 to start with, or make a one-time donation starting at $5. This will help us continue making these videos. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He smile on you and be gracious to you. Thank you, and God bless you.